Okay, so uh, let's get started. Again, it's gonna be, unfortunately, there's gonna be a lot of lectures from now on where I'm gonna be in the middle of a proof and we have to stop because some of these arguments are quite long. Uh, we were in the middle of proving the index lemma. So I will remind you what the statement of the index lemma is. This is gonna be a tool we're gonna to use to prove the route comparison theorem, which we'll start today, but we'll certainly not finish today. Uh, and we're also gonna, I think, use it in chapters uh, 11 and 12 as well. So I'm going to remind you what the statement is. I'm going to tell you how far we got last time, and we'll start from there. So the statement is as follows. We take a geodesic on M, and we suppose that there are no conjugate points to the initial point along gamma. So gamma of T is not conjugate to gamma of zero for all T bigger than zero, less than or equal to A. Remember, that means that there's no Jacobi fields, non-trivial Jacobi fields that vanish at zero and T for some T positive. Now let's suppose we have a Jacobi field that's normal everywhere to, to gamma prime, that's is a normal Jacobi field. And we take a piecewise smooth vector field along gamma that's also normal uh, to gamma prime. And we suppose that they're both zero at the initial point and that there's some positive time T naught where they're equal, okay? They certainly, this can't be zero because if J of T naught was zero, then J would be, would be, uh, would be zero. Um, well, I mean, it, it could be zero, but, but, but we want a non-trivial non -trivial Jacobi field. Otherwise, there's nothing really to this uh, statement. And, uh, and the conclusion is that the index form up to T naught of JJ is less than or equal to the index form up to T naught of VV with equality if and only if V is equal to J on zero to T naught, right? We don't know what happens after T naught and recall I'll remind you what the index form was. Recall I T of V V is the integral from zero to T of V prime V prime minus R of V gamma prime gamma prime V. Okay. So if you integrate by parts here, you can make this a V inner product V double prime with a minus sign. And that's the, the Jacobi equation, right? This is where this, this expression came uh, as the integral part of the second variation formula. The integral part of the second variation formula. Okay, so we started the proof last time. I'll remind you how far we got. We let script J be the space of normal Jacobi fields. along gamma uh, such that they vanish at the initial time. We know this is an N minus one dimensional vector space. N is the dimension of the manifold. Um, and let's let J one up to J N minus one be a basis. So we did some, uh, we know we can write J as the sum from K equals one up to N minus one alpha K J K on zero A, where alpha one up to alpha N minus one are constants. That's because J is in that space. So it's a linear combination of the basis, vec basis vectors. And we showed last time with some hard work that there exists uh, piecewise smooth functions F1 up to Fn minus one from zero A to the reals, such that uh, V is the sum from K equals one up to N minus one, Fk, Jk um, on zero A. So the way we did this, I'll just remind you, there was two parts to it. First of all, there was a, there was a property of Jacobi fields that we proved at the end of chapter five that used the fact that this uh, gamma of T is not conjugate to gamma of zero for any positive T, which told us that the J, K at T were a basis for the tangent space to M at, at gamma of T for all positive T. So we could certainly do this away from zero. And then we worked hard to show that in fact, these functions extend smoothly to zero, okay? 
So, I mean, we know that V at zero is zero. So these coefficients, uh, you know, th these are not independent. These also vanish at zero, but these functions, which are uniquely defined on positive zero, uh, uh, um, greater than zero up to A, in fact, extend smoothly to zero. So that's where we were last time. That was all last time, yeah, just recapping. Okay, so now we're gonna continue the proof. Uh, we want to show, well, let, let's, here's the claim. This was claim number one, okay? This was claim number one. We did this. Claim number two is where we're gonna start today. On the interior of each subinterval, of zero A on which um, each FK is piecewise smooth, each FK is smooth, we have the following. I'm gonna write it over here. Um, v prime, V prime minus R of V gamma prime, gamma prime V. That's the, that's the integrand of the index form. Integrand of the index form. Um, it's equal to sum over I, F I prime J I, sum over J, F J prime J J, plus D by D T, of sum over i, f i, j i, sum over j, f j, j j prime. Okay, so in this term where there's no derivative, that we have primes on the f's and not on the j's, here there's a derivative, this is completely unprimed, and here we have a prime only on the j. So we're going to prove this just by calculating both sides. Um, and then it'll follow pretty quickly from this claim uh, how the how the lemma follows. Okay, so I don't want to keep writing the sums. Now all uh, all repeated indices are summed from one to k to n minus one. So we can stop writing all those summation symbols. What do we have? First of all, we have R of v gamma prime gamma prime. Well, that's equal to R of F K J K gamma prime gamma prime. And that's equal to the F's come out R of J K gamma prime gamma prime. And then using the Jacobi equation, because, uh, because J K is a Jacobi field, this whole thing is minus J K double prime. Okay, each of the J K's is a Jacobi field. And let's write uh, V as F I J I. So if I covariantly differentiate this with the product rule, I'll have F I prime J I plus F I J I prime. And I want to take, I want to calculate the left hand side of this expression. So if I compute the inner product of V prime with V prime, so I'm gonna take this expression, write it again with another dummy index J and take the inner product and use the bilinearity. This is going to be, um, this is going to be um, F I prime F J prime J I J J. That's when I take the two terms with the F prime and then the cross terms are gonna be the same, fi prime fj, ji, jj prime, plus fi fj, ji prime, jj prime. So really, you know, what I did is I wrote out the, the two mixed terms, uh, the, out, the outside, outside and the inside, inside, sorry, the two outside and the two inside, 
and I swap the I and the J in one of them, in one of the terms, because they're dummy index. So here, only the Fs are differentiated, here only the Js, here one F and one J is differentiated. Um, I mean, you know, it was, it was Fi prime Ji with Fj, Jj prime plus Fi Ji prime with Fj prime Jj. So this is what I wrote, this one, but in here you can just swap the roles of I and J, right? And it's the same thing. So, uh, so that's uh, these three terms is this one, and I want to take minus R of V gamma prime gamma prime inner product V. And I calculated over there uh, that the expression with the curvature is just minus F uh, I J I double prime. So then I'm going to have a minus sign again. So I'm going to get a F I J I double prime inner product with V, which is an F J J J. Okay, so this is the this is the left hand side of claim two that we want to prove. Uh, what we're going to do now is calculate this time derivative here and move it to the left and see that we get the claim. So we also have, if I compute d by dt of fi ji fj jj prime, again, uh, I'm going to, I have the Metric compatibility, so it's going to be d by dt of this inner product this plus this times d by dt of that, and then I'll have a product rule on each of those. So when I differentiate the fi there, I'm going to have this, um, and then I'm going to differentiate the j, uh, the j, j i prime, j j prime. And that's, I've differentiated both of those guys. Now I have to differentiate this one, fi fj prime, ji jj prime. And now I differentiate the j. So fi fj, ji j, j double prime. And I hope I didn't make any mistakes. So now let's pair things up. So the one that has, um, Two derivatives of j's and no derivatives of f's is going to cancel with that one. The one that has the second derivative is also going to cancel when I take the difference. And this guy is going to partially cancel. Again, I can change. Uh, no, this is this one, right? So it doesn't quite cancel because I have two of them here and only one here. So when I take the difference, I'm going to be left with this guy, one of these, and minus that. Okay, so so v prime v prime minus r of v gamma prime gamma prime v minus e by dt of f i j i fj, jj prime is equal to, we said this guy is still there, fi prime, fj prime, ji, jj. And then only one of the, the yellow ones cancels, fi prime, fj, ji, jj prime. And then I have minus this guy. Okay, so now comparing what we want to prove, I moved, I moved this d by dt over to the left. And what do we have here? We have the two f primes with the two j's unprimed. This is what we have here, right? So we'll be done if we can show that the last two terms cancel. So claim two is proved if we show the last two terms cancel. Okay, so let's see why that is.
So let's look at the following function. Define, on, we're always on this subinterval where the f, all the f's are smooth, right? Define uh, h of t to be j i prime j j minus j i j j prime. So i and j is fixed. Um, h at time zero. Um, I just realized something. Oh yeah, the 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 JIs are Jacobi fields, so they're defined on the whole, the whole uh, zero to a, right? This is this is on zero a. The Jacobi fields are smooth. H at time zero is zero because each of these Js vanishes at time zero. That's how they were chosen. They were basis for the normal Jacobi fields that vanish at time zero. And what is H prime? Again, I use the product rule: JI double prime JJ plus JI prime. JJ prime minus JI prime, JJ prime minus JI, JJ double prime. These cancel right away, they're the same thing. And then using the Jacobi equation, because these are Jacobi fields, we're going to get a minus R of JI gamma prime, gamma prime JJ plus JI. I'll put it on the other way, the inner product is symmetric. R of uh, JJ gamma prime, gamma prime JI. And these cancel because of the symmetries of the Riemann curvature tensor. Uh, the Riemann curvature tensor, right? So I can swap, this is as a zero four tensor, this is R of JI gamma prime, gamma prime JJ. And this is the same thing with the I and the J swapped, but these guys are the same. So by the symmetries of the Riemann curvature tensor, this gives us zero. Um, I want to keep, I want to keep that on the board. So this function is zero at time zero, and its derivative is zero. So h prime is zero on zero a. H of zero equals zero. This implies that h of t is zero for all t. But now multiply both sides by what do we want to, um, we want to here, I can swap the, the roles of the dummy indices i and j. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna call this i and this j, that's the same as doing this, okay? So by fi prime fj and sum, over i and j, we get fi prime fj. What was h? It was ji prime jj minus ji jj prime. That equals zero. And that's exactly, I hope, that's minus what I have there, right? So it's still zero. Okay, so claim two is proved. Okay, so we have this uh, this expression on every subinterval um, on which the f's are p are smooth. The statement of the lemma is long since gone, but you'll remember what it is when when the proof comes up. So apply claim number two to both. Uh, v and j. Uh, so for here, this is on um, on the subinterval where each fk is smooth, and then sum over uh, all those subintervals. So what do we get? Let's do it for v first. We get that i t naught of v v. Remember, this was the integral from zero t naught of v prime v prime minus r of v gamma prime gamma prime v dt, and that's the left hand side of my claim number two. So, uh, so I'm integrating claim number two 
you know, from TK minus one to TK and I'm summing over all those TKs, uh, this becomes, um, by the fundamental theorem of calculus, I'm gonna integrate a time derivative from zero to T naught. So that's just gonna be this guy evaluated at T naught minus this guy evaluated at zero, but at zero it vanishes because all the JIs vanish. And then I'll have the integral of that guy. So this is gonna be um, F I J I F J J J prime at T naught. That's, the, that's integrating the time derivative and it's zero at, at time zero plus the integral from zero to T naught of F I prime J I F J prime J J E T. That's right. Uh, that's, that's applying claim number two to V. And if we apply, apply it to J, remember that the FK equals alpha K for J and FK prime therefore is zero. So we're only gonna get, uh, these guys are gonna be gone because the derivatives are zero. We're only gonna get this thing with the Fs replaced by alphas. So we're gonna have alpha I, J I, alpha J, J, J prime at T naught. Okay. So now we are done because we wanna look at the difference. So since, remember the hypothesis was that V at time T naught equals J at time T naught. This means that FK at T naught equals uh, alpha K for all K, right? So if I take the difference of these two things at T naught, these are the same J's there. These coefficients are the same. So this term, which is the only term that shows up there is gonna cancel. And we're only gonna be left with the integral term. So we get that I T naught of VV, uh, I mean, this is true for all for all t, right? But but in particular, it's t naught um, minus i t naught of j j is just equal to the integral from zero to t naught. What is this expression? This is the sum over k f k prime j k all squared, which is greater than or equal to zero. Okay, so we've shown that i t naught of v v is greater than or equal to i t naught of j j. That was, that was the index lemma. That's what we wanted to show. And now we wanna show that the only way you get equality is if v equals j on that closed bounded interval. So suppose we have equality. This means that the sum over k, f k prime j k equals zero for all t in zero up to T naught, because remember these guys were piecewise smooth. So it's continuous. Uh, and also the JK are linearly independent for all uh, JK at T are linearly independent for T bigger than zero, okay? And that means that F K prime of T is zero for uh, T bigger than zero. Uh, and then you know, by continuity, remember we, we extended them smoothly to T equals zero. Uh, F K prime is identically zero on zero T naught. Um, that means that F K of t, fk is constant on zero t naught, but fk of t naught is alpha k. That means that fk of t is alpha k for all t in zero t naught. And that means that v equals j on zero t naught. 
Okay, so that's the index lemma. It tells us that as long as you don't have any conjugate points on that geodesic, if you have any um, point, if you have any, uh, if you have a Jacobi field, which vanishes at time zero, and you have any other piecewise smooth vector field B, which also vanishes at time zero, they're both normal to, to gamma prime, then uh, the index form up to time T naught uh, is, is so, the, and J of T naught equals V of T naught, right? Then the index form of J will be less than or equal to the index form on V, and the only way they're going to be equal is going to be if V equals J on that interval. Okay. We are going to use this to prove Rauch comparison. One, two, three, four. I have eight pages for the proof of Rauch comparison in my notes. And I think we have enough time. Are there any questions about the index lemma before we start? Okay, so um, I think I, I, I misspoke a couple of lecture go, lectures ago. I said that the Rauch comparison theorem was another application of second variation formula. It's not, uh, it does use a lot of properties of um, Jacobi field and it does use the index lemma, but we didn't use the second variation formula here. It's just that the index form is arises as part of the second variation formula. So it doesn't make sense to motivate why is this index form important? Why on earth would we consider it if you haven't seen the second variation formula? Okay. So let me see. I might need, I wanna fit it on one board and keep it on the, on the board as long as possible. but I don't think I can fit it on one board. So, so we'll apply the index lemma to prove the following theorem, which is a very powerful result in Riemannian geometry. It allows you to compare two Riemannian manifolds they don't even have to have the same dimension. If you can compare their curvatures, then you can say something comparatively about their Jacobi fields. And I motivated this before we got to the index lemma last Wednesday. I was reminding you that the, the curvature measures the sort of spreading of the Jacobi fields, that if you expand, Taylor expand the norm of a Jacobi field near t equals zero, then the, the first non-trivial term, the first uh, deviation from the Euclidean case is that it involves a curvature. And the idea was to try to make this a more global statement, not just for T small. So let's let M N G and M N plus K, M tilde, N plus K, G tilde, be Riemannian manifolds. So K is at least zero, but it could be positive. So this could be a higher dimensional space, but, but uh, M is the one with the, smaller dimension or equal, uh, let gamma and gamma tilde be geodesics. The first one is on M and the second one is on M tilde and they're defined for the same amount of time um, with the same velocity. So that means that the norm of gamma prime of T equals the norm of gamma tilde prime of t for all t. Well, it's constant, right? It's for all, uh, for all t in zero a. We know that the speed of a geodesic is constant. This is the inner product on a g, and this is g tilde. Um, let's let j and j tilde be Jacobi fields along gamma and gamma tilde respectively. Uh, such that, first of all, they both vanish at time zero. Um, J prime zero 
inner product gamma prime zero is the same as J tilde prime zero, inner product gamma tilde prime zero. These are not necessarily zero. Remember, if you have a Jacobi field, it's uniquely determined by its initial value and its initial covariant derivative. And uh, this is just saying that they have the same component of their initial covariant derivative in the direction of their, of their geodesics. And finally, that the norms of the initial covariant derivatives are equal. Okay, so these are the three conditions on these Jacobi fields. And again, this, this, if this was zero, this positive, if this non-negative real number was zero, then both of these Jacobi fields would be identically zero. Uh, sorry, that's if there's no conjugate points. No, no, that's right. This is initial point and initial velocity. If this was zero, then the, both Jacobi fields would be, would be zero, which is not gonna be interesting. Um, and now assume, first of all, uh, gamma tilde has no conjugate points on you get points on zero A, the one that could possibly be larger dimension. Uh, two, for all T in zero A and all V in T gamma T and V tilde in T gamma tilde T of M tilde, uh, we have that the sectional curvature of M tilde in the plane spanned by V tilde and gamma tilde prime of T is at least as large as the sectional curvature in M of the plane spanned by V and gamma prime. Um, then the norm of J tilde is less than or equal to the norm of G J for all T. Remember, we saw this, I'm not finished writing the statement. We saw this when we were motivating the Rauch comparison theorem, that if the curvature of M tilde is bigger than the curvature of M, then at least for small time, this was true, right? Now we're proving it for all time. Uh, moreover, sorry, I know I shouldn't write this low, but I wanna put the whole statement here. If for some T naught bigger than zero, uh, we have, equality here, J tilde of T naught in the norms equals J of T naught, uh, then the curvature in the plane spanned by J tilde and gamma tilde prime is equal to the curvature in M spanned by J T and gamma prime T for all T up to T naught. Okay, and you can sort of already see how the index lemma is going to show up, right? Because the index lemma was some inequality. And then if we had equality at some time, then it, it told us something stronger. Okay. Um, so strictly speaking, I guess here, I only, I only, this only makes sense if V is orthogonal to gamma prime and if V tilde is orthogonal to gamma tilde prime, right? Because I can't define the sectional curvature unless I take two linearly independent vectors. Um, so that's implied when I write this down. Um, okay. So any questions about the statement? Let's see if we can keep the statement. If I wanna keep the statement, I have one, two, three, four boards to work with. Um, we'll see. I want to at least keep it for a while. By the way, uh, I, I think we might be able to prove it today, but we're not going to get to the applications till Wednesday. Uh, one of the applications will be that um, you can use this theorem if you know something about the curvature, the sectional curvature on, on the Riemannian manifold, you can deduce something about how far away consecutive conjugate points are on a geodesic. Okay. And um, We've already seen that conjugate points are places where bad things happen, right? Where the exponential map is no, is no longer, um, it's a critical point for the exponential map. So it's no longer local diffeomorphism at those points. But on assignment four, which I posted yesterday, 
the first thing you'll do is to show that if you have a conjugate point along a geodesic, then after that conjugate point, the geodesic is definitely never minimizing, right? So they're, they're only minimizing, uh, they can only be minimizing until the first conjugate point. Once they pass a conjugate point, they can't be minimizing anymore, right? So that's giving you more geometric meaning for conjugate points. Okay. Let's do this. So recall um, at the end of chapter five, when we proved a whole bunch of properties of Jacobi fields, we saw that the inner product of JT with gamma prime of T was an affine linear function. It was J prime zero gamma prime zero times T plus J of zero gamma prime of zero. That was one of the properties for any Jacobi field. Jacobi field along gamma. Um, we have j of zero equals j tilde of zero equals zero and j prime zero inner product gamma prime zero is equal to j tilde prime zero gamma tilde prime zero, right? The, the first two of the properties that are circled on the right-hand board are, are this one and this one. So that means this term is gone for both of them. And this term is the same. So, um, so J, this term is the same, and this is just a T. So that means that J of T inner product gamma prime of T is equal to J tilde of T inner product gamma tilde prime of T for all T. Right? Those first two conditions force uh, the inner product of the Jacobi field with the direction vector of the geodesic to always be the same. Um, also, um, if, I, if I now take this equation, this part is zero for us. Uh, and if I multiply it um, by gamma prime of t on both sides, I get that j of t gamma prime of t times gamma prime of t is equal to j prime of zero, gamma prime of zero, t gamma prime of t. Um, and gamma prime of t in norm is equal to gamma tilde prime of t in norm is the same, right? These are the same speed. So what does this say? This says, the tangential components of J and J tilde have the same length, right? Because I wanna take, what is the tangential component? If I take J of T, I wanna take the inner product with gamma prime of T, the unit vector in the gamma prime of T direction. Uh, and I wanna take the length of this. That's going to be J prime of zero, gamma prime of zero absolute value times the absolute value of T times gamma prime of T over C squared. And this is the same for, for gamma and gamma tilde. So this is the same and this is the same, right? So if I replace this with the tildes, It's equal. Okay, so what does that mean? We're going to argue that we can, without loss of generality, assume that our Jacobi fields are normal. So we can write J as a tangential part plus a normal part, and we can write J tilde as a tangential part plus a normal part. And if I take the norm squared, these are orthogonal to each other and j tilde, this is j tilde t squared plus j tilde n squared. So we just showed on the previous board that these are equal, okay? So therefore, to our, what do we wanna prove? We wanna prove that j tilde in norm is less than or equal to j in norm. So um, 
j squared minus j tilde squared is equal to j n squared minus j tilde n squared. So, um, so we can, without loss of generality, suppose that both uh, j and j tilde are normal Jacobi fields. fields because the conclusion is unchanged. So let's look at the statement and make sure we understand that. Um, so we want to prove um, J, J tilde N will be less than or equal to J if and only if it's true for the normal parts, right? And their tangential parts have the same length. And then uh, the equality will only happen if their normal parts have the same norm. And then the tangential part doesn't contribute to this anyway, right? There's, if there's a tangential part and I wedge it with, with gamma prime, it drops out. So what we're trying to prove uh, is gonna be unchanged if we assume that both Jacobi fields are normal. Okay, so without loss of generality, we can assume that J gamma prime equals J tilde gamma tilde prime is zero for all T. Okay. Also, so I've used these first two conditions. I haven't used this one yet. We also have that the norm of J prime of zero equals the norm of J tilde prime of zero. If these are both zero, let's call this lambda, which is greater than or equal to zero. If lambda equals zero, then uh, both J and J tilde are identically zero and the conclusion is trivial, right? Because if J and J tilde are both zero, then certainly this holds and equality holds everywhere. And um, I mean, this doesn't even make sense, right? Because, because J is, is, uh, is zero. So you, you, don't, you can't talk about this extra curvature in the direction of J. So assume lambda is positive. Um, okay. I think I can, I think I can erase this. I don't, I'm not gonna use this again. And I can also erase, I don't think I'm gonna use these again, but I'm gonna keep this part, right? Because we haven't used these conditions yet. Okay, let's define F of T to be the norm of J of T squared and F tilde of T to be the norm of J tilde of T squared. So both F and F tilde are smooth because Jacobi fields are smooth and the norm squared is smooth. Um, and since gamma tilde has no conjugate points, that's this guy here, um, we know that we have that F tilde of T is positive for all T, for all T bigger than zero, right? F, F of zero and F tilde of zero are zero, right? The, the Jacobi fields vanish at time zero, but this guy doesn't vanish at any other time because if it did, that's exactly a conjugate point. Okay. So the function, f of t divided by f tilde of t is well-defined for all t positive. Okay. Uh, what do we wanna show? We wanna show that the norm of j is bigger than the norm of j tilde. That's the same as the square, this squared is bigger than this squared. We want to show 
that f tilde, uh, f over f tilde is at least one. Okay. Um, well, I'm being a little sloppy here, right? At, we want to show that, that f is greater than or equal to f tilde on zero a. Okay, but we know that at zero, they're equal. And we know that at time bigger than zero, the, the denominator is positive. So we want to show that equivalently, f over f tilde is at least one on open zero closed a. That's what we want to show. Okay. Um, now this is, this is a nice use of elementary first variable calculus, first year calculus, single variable calculus. So what is F prime? F prime is two J, J prime, and F tilde prime is two J tilde, J tilde prime. So because J vanishes at time zero, we have that F prime of zero is F tilde prime of zero is zero. And what about F double prime? That's gonna be two J prime squared plus two J, J double prime. And F tilde double prime is two J tilde prime squared plus two J tilde, J tilde double prime. Um, so I wanna look at the limit as T goes to zero of f of t over f tilde of t. Well, this goes, this is zero over zero. These are both smooth functions, right? Um, so this is a zero over zero. So I wanna apply L'Hopital's rule and I'll get the limit as of f prime over f tilde prime, but that's also zero over zero. So we do it twice. This is the limit as t goes to zero of f double prime of t over f tilde double prime of t. And now this is gonna be zero there because j and j tilde are zero, but this is not gonna be zero. And it's going to, the ratio is, is one, right? This is equal to j prime zero squared over j tilde prime zero squared, which is one. Okay, so this function has limit one f over f tilde. It's defined for t positive, and it has limit one as t goes to zero. So to prove that j tilde is less than or equal to j on um, zero a, it suffices to show that d by dt of f over f tilde is greater than or equal to zero, okay? Because this function uh, starts out at one and if it's increasing, then it's always gonna be at least one. But uh, by the quotient rule, this is equivalent to showing that f prime f tilde minus f f tilde prime is greater than or equal to zero, right? Because this is the denominator, that's just d by dt of this quotient. Uh, this is always positive for, for t greater than uh, zero. So this is equivalent to f prime f tilde is greater than or equal to f f tilde prime on zero a. So this is what we need to show. Okay, we reduce it to this calculus statement. Suppose that f of some t naught equals zero. So let t naught be some, um, some time where f vanishes. That means j of t naught equals zero because remember the definition of f was just the norm of j. Um, and that means that f prime of t naught, of t naught equals zero. Because if you go back and you look at the expression for f prime, 
if j vanishes at some time t naught, then f prime will vanish. Uh, and you see that both sides of this will then be zero at t naught. So star holds whenever f of t naught is zero. Okay. So now we can assume that f of t naught is positive because it's not negative. So now suppose f of t naught is positive. The what we're saying here is that star holds trivially at any point where f vanishes. So I can even put uh, zero here because we know that f vanishes at time zero, right? So it holds at time zero and it holds at any other time where f vanishes. So now we can suppose f of t naught is positive. So that certainly t naught has to be bigger than zero. Um, So we want to show that f prime over f is bigger than or equal to f tilde prime t naught over f tilde t naught. Right? I've just rearranged uh, uh, star. Okay, let's define u of t to be one over the square root of f of t naught times j of t naught, j of t, and u tilde of t to be one over the same, uh, no, sorry, f tilde of t naught. We know that f tilde is never zero, right? After, after time zero, um, j tilde of t. So these are just constant multiples of j and j tilde, okay? Um, and therefore they're both Jacobi fields because the space of Jacobi fields is a, is a vector space. So this one is on, um, on gamma and gamma tilde respectively. Okay, and the way I've chosen to define them, you can see that at time t naught, um, they have length one. So u of t naught and u tilde of t naught are, have, have length one. Because this is exactly um, the norm of j tilde at t naught, and this is the norm of j uh, at t naught. And this is only only at t naught. So let's compute. We want to show this, right? So let's compute f prime of t naught over f of t naught. That's going to be by the formula for f prime, which is still on the on the left, j prime t naught j of t naught over j of t naught j of t naught this is f of t naught right so i can write it as the square root of f of t naught times the square root of f of t naught so this is going to be 2 u prime t naught u of t naught which is the same thing as inner product of u u prime at t naught Um, I haven't used two yet, but I don't think it makes sense for me to write up here. So I'll go back to the left. So this is, this guy is this. And similarly, F tilde of T naught over a uh, prime over F tilde of T naught is U tilde, U tilde prime at T naught. Now you can start to see where the index lemma is going to come in. We're doing fine on time. Okay, so, so F prime at T naught divided by F at T naught, we just showed is the derivative of u inner product u at t naught. But by the fundamental theorem of calculus, that's equal to the integral from zero to t naught of the second derivative of u dt, right? Because the integral of the second derivative is the first derivative at the two endpoints. 
but at, at t equals zero, u vanishes, right? Because j vanishes at t equals zero. So I wrote this as an integral. Um, and then that's equal to, by just uh, multiplying this out, this is two u u prime prime, and that's equal to two integral zero to t naught u prime u prime plus u u double prime. Um, and then because u is a Jacobi field, it's a scalar multiple of j, uh, this becomes zero to t naught u prime u prime minus r of u gamma prime gamma prime u. Right, I just wrote out the Jacobi equation for u double prime. And that's equal to two times the index form up to t naught applied to u u. Okay, so what have we shown? We've shown that f of t naught over f, f prime of t naught over f of t naught is two i t naught u u. And exactly the same calculation with tildes everywhere. gives you two i t naught of u tilde u tilde. And now you can see that this star, which I want to compare these two expressions, is a comparison of the index forms. So that's where the index lemma is going to come in. You don't need this guy anymore. So star becomes um, I T naught of U tilde U tilde is less than or equal to I T naught of U U. So this is what we have to prove. Okay. So let's let E1 up to EN be a parallel orthonormal frame along gamma. With uh, E1 being gamma prime over the norm of gamma prime. Remember, gamma prime is not necessarily normalized. And E2 at T naught to be U of T naught. OK? So um, what have I done here? Here's where we use the fact that u at t naught is length one. And we also use the fact that j is orthogonal to gamma prime for all t. So it's, it's still here, right? The, we, we, when we made the assumption that we can now consider normalized Jacobi fields, no, normal Jacobi fields, this guy's orthogonal to gamma prime. And at time uh, t naught, u of t naught is, is orthogonal to gamma prime and it has length one. So this could be E2 at t naught. And what I'm doing now is I'm doing parallel transport back and forward from t naught. So do parallel transport forwards and backwards from t naught. From gamma t naught. Usually we did this at the initial point and we parallel transported Along uh, along gamma from from gamma of zero, but now I'm I'm I've got this unit vector at t naught, and I'm I'm parallel transporting back and forth. I don't need this anymore. And similarly, let e one tilde up to e n plus k tilde be a parallel orthonormal frame along gamma tilde such that uh, E1 tilde again is, is the, is the uh, velocity of the geodesic and E2 of T naught is U tilde of T naught. Okay, so I have these two conditions.
OK, so I've reduced it to showing this. This is the new star, right? And I've chosen these frames. Suppose I want to I want to define an operation which takes vector fields along gamma to vector fields along gamma tilde, which has nice properties where I can use it to compare. Because you see, these are these are index forms on different manifolds, right? This is on m tilde, and this is on m, and the index lemma is about the index form for two different vector fields in this, along the same geodesic, right? So I can't just apply the index lemma here. Um, suppose V is a piecewise smooth vector field along gamma, we can write using this frame, we can write V of T is the sum from i equals one up to n, g i of t, e i of t, where g i is from zero a to r is piecewise smooth. This is just using the fact that these guys are an orthonormal frame. And define a, a vector field phi v along gamma tilde by the following phi v of t is going to be the same coefficients, but now we have e i tilde of t. Okay, so this doesn't involve doesn't involve En plus one tilde up to En plus k tilde. Okay. Whenever I have a um, piecewise smooth vector field along gamma, I can do this, and this is piecewise smooth because the g's are piecewise smooth. So let's look at some properties of this map. So map this map phi is taking vector fields along gamma to vector fields along gamma tilde. You can see that by construction of phi, first of all, it's an isometry, right? Because how do I get the norm of this? These are orthonormal. So the norm of this is the sum of the squares of the GIs, the norm squared, but so is this, right? So it's an isometry. And also, if I take phi of V and I covariantly differentiate it along gamma tilde, that's equal to phi applied to V prime, because if I want to take prime of this, those guys are parallel. So it's just going to be the GI primes. But that's exactly what happens if I do prime of this first, because these are parallel. I'll just get the GI primes, and phi sends it to that with the GI primes. So these two conditions are obvious from the definition of the map phi. Uh, let me call these A and B, because I'm going to use them. Now I'm going to finally use condition two on the curvature. Okay. So since the geodesics have the same velocity, the same speed, and um, by the hypothesis two, well, let me do one step at a time. Uh, what do we get? We have that um, if V is in uh, T gamma T of M um, orthogonal to gamma prime of T and length one, and V tilde is in T gamma tilde T of M tilde orthogonal to gamma tilde prime of T and length one, then um, V this thing is equal to um, V tilde squared gamma tilde prime squared. This is where I use the fact that they have the same speed. 
these are both length one here, and this is zero. This is equal to V tilde wedge gamma tilde prime squared. Okay, so, so that's uh, immediate. And now by the hypothesis two on the, on the sectional curvatures, we have V composed uh, V uh, wedge gamma prime squared times K of V wedge gamma prime. Um, that's equal to R of V gamma prime, gamma prime V. Uh, and this is, this is greater than or equal to, see the, 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 sorry, less than or equal to, this is less than or equal to K tilde of V tilde wedge gamma tilde prime. And this is the same. Right. These are equal, and this is less than or equal to this. So this is less than or equal to this, and this is R tilde of V tilde, gamma tilde prime, gamma tilde prime, V tilde. So in fact, I don't need this to be length one. I just need this to be equal, right? That's all I needed, that these had the same length. So I, I wanna keep that guy. So let's apply now this curvature assumption that says that this is less than or equal to this one. Uh, so hence, if I if I let uh, let little v let v be equal to um, v at time t and let v tilde be phi v at time t, these have the same norm, um, I guess, strictly speaking, um, this, what I wrote here is all correct, right? But I really want uh, things that are normal to gamma prime. So, um, it doesn't change these things, right? And and my u and u tilde are normal to. Uh, I'm going to apply this to u and u to u to u. So this is. Um, so assume that uh, g one is zero, so v is normal to gamma prime, uh, and then phi v is normal to gamma tilde prime, okay? So I'm gonna do that and what do I get? I'm gonna plug them in, in here. We get R tilde of phi V gamma tilde prime, gamma tilde prime inner product phi V is greater than or equal to R of V gamma prime, gamma prime V. Um, also, phi of V prime, phi of V prime, that's equal to phi of V prime, phi of V prime, which is equal to V prime, V prime, okay? Using, using these two properties, A, and this is, uh, this is B and this is A, okay? So that means if I calculate the um, index form, we get I T naught of phi U, what did I, sorry. Uh, this is, this is, yeah, this is true. So U, U certainly has the property that it's, u is normal to gamma prime and u tilde is normal to gamma tilde prime. Uh, so I get, if I do this, this is the integral from zero to t naught of phi u prime phi u prime um, minus r of phi u gamma 
prime gamma prime phi u dt, what have I shown? That this is equal to um, zero to t naught u prime u prime. Uh, and that guy is, this is for any v which is normal to, to gamma prime. So this guy is less than this. So minus this will be greater than minus that. Uh, sorry, this guy, uh, what am I doing? I put the wrong, uh, no, this is right. Sorry, this should be, this should be, this is on M tilde, right? So these should be tilde. Okay, phi of u is on m tilde. So this guy is greater than or equal to this. So minus that will be less than or equal to. Dt, uh, which is i t naught of u u. Okay, so what have we shown? We've shown that i t naught of phi u phi u uh, is less than or equal to i t naught of u u. Let's call this one dagger. We're almost done. It's been fine. Okay, now we're going to use the index lemma because we have two vector fields now on m tilde. We have phi of u and we have u tilde. So u tilde and phi of u are both vector fields, piecewise smooth vector fields along um, gamma tilde. u tilde of zero is zero. That's because j tilde of zero is zero. Phi u of zero is zero, and that's because j of zero equals zero. Remember, u was up to a constant, was uh, was uh, was j, and phi was an isometry, so it doesn't take zero to zero. And u tilde is orthogonal to uh, gamma prime. This is because j tilde and gamma prime tilde are, are zero, and phi u gamma tilde prime equals zero. And that's again, because uh, J is orthogonal to gamma prime and uh, phi is an isometry. So you should, uh, you should check that phi of gamma prime is gamma tilde prime. Right? that's clear from the definition of phi. Um, So we claim that u tilde of t naught is equal to phi u at t naught. Well, let's see uh, what we had. We had u tilde at t naught was e2 tilde at t naught. And phi u at t naught is phi of u of t naught, which is phi of e2 of t naught, which is e2 tilde of t naught. By the definition of u and u tilde, uh, uh, by the definition of the e2s and the definition of phi. Okay, so we've got, um, these are both, these two vector fields along gamma tilde, they both vanish at time zero. They're both orthogonal to the geodesic gamma tilde and they agree at time zero. And also, um, also, u tilde is a Jacobi field because it was just a constant multiple of j tilde. So we can apply the index lemma. The index lemma applies. We get um, i t naught of u tilde u tilde is less than or equal to i t naught of phi u phi u.
by you. Call this guy sharp. Okay, so now sharp and dagger gives you star, right? Because this guy's less than that guy, which is less than this guy. Okay, so we proved, um, so we proved, I'm gonna be able to finish. We proved uh, the, we proved that, um, Um, what did we prove? J tilde is less than or equal to J for all T. Okay. Uh, notice that hence F of T is at least F of T naught, which is, po uh, sorry, F tilde of T, which is positive for all T bigger than zero. So one conclusion we get already our, our, our assumption was that gamma tilde had no conjugate points, but now we know that gamma has no conjugate points. So uh, gamma of t is not conjugate to gamma of zero for all t positive. Right? That wasn't part of the hypothesis. It's a conclusion we, we found. The only thing that, that's left to prove now is this uh, statement about the equality. Right, that if equality holds um, for some time t naught on the norms on f and f tilde, then we get this result about the curvature. So finally, suppose uh, that j of t naught equals j tilde of t naught in norm for some t naught positive. We've shown that f of t over f tilde of t is increasing for all t from zero to a, right? Because the derivative is greater than or equal to zero and, uh, and it's equal to one at time, uh, time zero. It, the limit is one at time zero. And j of t naught is equal to j tilde of t naught is positive. Our hypothesis is this, right? They, these are positive. There's no more. There's no more. Um, there's no conjugate points anywhere. So this implies uh, that f over f tilde is constant on zero to t naught, right? Because it's it, the limit as t goes to zero is one. Its derivative is greater than or equal to zero, and we're assuming that at some other positive time t, it's still one. That means it didn't, didn't go up at all. Uh, so hence, f prime f tilde is equal to f tilde prime f for all t from zero to t naught. That's just the derivative, the numerator of the derivative of f over f tilde. So all the, all the inequalities above are actually equalities. Okay, so here Docarmo leaves some gaps in the argument. So from so we have two two inequalities that become equality, dagger and sharp, right? So from I T of U tilde U tilde equals I T of phi U and phi U and the index lemma. We know about equality in the index lemma. We get that U tilde is phi U on zero t naught. That's exactly the equality case in the index lemma. And from i t of phi u, phi u equals i t of u u on uh, for all t in zero t naught, um, we get, if you guys give me 90 seconds. I think we'll be done. I've erased the conclusion, unfortunately. Um, we get zero to t phi u prime phi u prime minus r tilde phi u gamma tilde.
prime gamma two the prime prime mu dt um, is equal to zero to t, and we already know that this. Well, I'm, I'm just writing this guy. We already know that these are equal. That means that these are equal. Um, but by the inequality on curvature, right? This integral equals this integral. But one of them is always greater than or equal to the other. The only way that can happen is if they're equal. We get r tilde of phi u gamma tilde prime gamma tilde prime phi u is equal to r u gamma prime gamma prime u on zero and t naught. And that, what does that mean? Um, this one is already equal to u tilde. So if you now uh, multiply through by f of t naught, you get uh, that r tilde of j tilde gamma prime tilde equals r of j gamma prime on zero t naught. Okay, so I, I went through this thing, this last bit a little quick, but it's not hard to see what's happening. Okay, sorry, I went two minutes over, but I really didn't want to leave two, you know, two minutes of a proof that we've been doing for an hour. Um, on, on Wednesday, I'll restate the Rauch comparison theorem. Obviously, we're done with the proof. We're never going to look at the proof again. And I'm going to talk about two applications of it. And then we will probably move on to chapter 11. Okay, any questions? So, so as I said, Docarmo is a little sloppy at the end of this proof here because he only talks about one of these equalities, sharp or dagger, and then he, he kind of forgets to mention the other one, but you need to use both of them to get the conclusion. <laughs>